Why we are where we are. Derailed. Some of you may not be familiar with this man on the left. His name was Leroy Froome. He was a very prolific uh, Seventh-day Adventist author. He wrote The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, a three-volume set, I believe. It was about this thick, about two inches thick. He wrote another series of books called The Conditionless Faith of Our Fathers, uh, which were equally as thick. Also wrote a book that was published, I believe, in the 1970s called Movement of Destiny. Brilliant man, brilliant man. But this man, Leroy Froome, and another gentleman by the name of Roy Allen Anderson were instrumental in derailing the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Instrumental in derailing. They got the... They took Seventh-day Adventism and pushed it down a road from which it has never recovered. And it will not recover. It will not. These two men have brought such horrible confusion and dismay and only eternity will sort out the mess that these two men made. Now you say, well, what mess did Leroy Froome and Roy Allen Anderson make that was so horrible that was so awful that we could say such terrible things about those two men. What did they do? When did they do it? Why did they do it? Who did they do it with? Let's take a look. The background. Through the 1940s, okay, and we're talking about almost from the inception of Seventh-day Adventism. I don't know when the word cult became a buzzword for anybody that was not right in the status quo. I don't know when that word came in to identify those. But all the way through the 1940s, the Seventh-day Adventist church was considered a cult. Okay, that was just common knowledge. But a great change came in in the 1950s. This is what happened. There was a conference president in Pennsylvania, his name was T.E. Unruh. He was listening to a radio program that was being done by Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was a very, very prominent evangelical. He wrote a magazine, uh, it was called Eternity Magazine. Well, while Donald Gray Barnhouse was giving this radio program, this uh, president of the East Pennsylvania Conference, a Seventh-day Adventist, T.E. Unruh, was very impressed with what Barnhouse said. And he contacted Barnhouse to commend him on this radio program. Through this contact that these two men had in the early 50s, Donald Gray Barnhouse got access to Seventh-day Adventists a few years later when Barnhouse's famous son-in-law, a man by the name of Walter Martin, a man by the name of Walter Martin. He was the son-in-law of Donald Gray Barnhouse. Now, if you go to almost any major, quote-unquote, Christian bookstore, and you go to the cult section, you will find books on cults. And the primary author of those books is Walter Martin. Walter Martin, I've been told, uh, had a photographic memory. He was a brilliant man, very, very intelligent man. Uh, but he used it for the wrong reasons. Well, Donald Gray Barnhouse knew Unruh from their contact. Walter Martin was writing a book on cults. So Barnhouse, Donald Gray Barnhouse and Walter Martin started meeting with Seventh-day Adventist leaders in the mid-1950s and the results were disastrous for Seventh-day Adventists. You see, Walter Martin wanted to ask the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church some questions about what we believed. So he got together a list of about 40 questions on Seventh-day Adventist beliefs because he wanted to give the Seventh-day Adventist Church a fair shake when he wrote his upcoming book on cults. Okay? Well, he presented these questions to the leaders, the Seventh-day Adventist leaders, among whom were 
Leroy Froome, Roy Allen Anderson, and uh, the president of the General Conference at that time was a man by the name of R.R. R. Figuer. So they got together, they started meeting. Sometimes they'd meet in Pennsylvania at Barnhouse's home. Sometimes they would go, Barnhouse and Martin would go to Washington, D.C., and they would meet in the General Conference buildings. But they had a series of meetings over a period of about two years. Now here are the two men, the two evangelicals. Uh, that's how we know them as today. Another word for them would be apostate Protestants. This man over here is Donald Gray Barnhouse, the head of Eternity Magazine and a radio speaker. This is his son-in-law, Walter Martin. These two men got together with Froome and Anderson and Figuer and had meetings on what Seventh-day Adventists really believed. Now, the title of this is The Onslaught. It says, when the meetings began, Walter Martin, wanting to deal fairly with Seventh-day Adventists, had a list of some 40 questions concerning what Seventh-day Adventists believes. The major points of great significance centered around four key beliefs that Seventh-day Adventists hold. Now, when you have 40 questions, you can look at an awful lot of different topics. But I'm just going to look at four key points that Martin wanted to primarily focus on with the leadership of Seventh-day Adventists. Number one, what nature did Christ take when he became a man? That was very important. Up to that time, for well nigh a hundred years plus, the Seventh-day Adventists had always held, based in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that when Jesus Christ came to this world, he took a nature like Adam after he fell. Okay? The reason why that was so important was, if you took the idea that Christ took a nature like Adam before he fell, well then Christ would have had an advantage over us. You see, before Adam fell, he had a perfect nature. But when Jesus Christ came to this world, he did not have a perfect nature. And we will look at some verses about that in a little while. So that was the first question. Martin and Barnhouse believed that Christ had a perfect nature that he could have never sinned, ever. The second question was this. Was the atonement finished at the cross or was Christ continuing the atonement in heaven? You see, from the very inception of Seventh-day Adventism, after the time of the Millerite movement in the 1830s into the 1840s, Seventh-day Adventists had always taught that Christ was finishing the atonement in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Martin and Barnhouse categorically rejected that idea, saying that the atonement was full, final, and complete when Jesus died. So there would be a conflict. That was the second question. Another one, what was Ellen White's role in Seventh-day Adventism? Was Ellen White on par? Was she equal with the biblical prophets? Was she just as inspired as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and all the other prophets? Or was Ellen White somehow less than them? That was an issue. That was a big issue with Walter Martin and Donald Gray Barnhouse on whether or not Seventh-day Adventists were still a cult. And finally, what about the Sabbath, Sunday, the remnant church, and the end of time? These four issues, folk. And if you look at these things, and if you think in mind for a moment, Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, it's very much like a series of dominoes that you set down on a table one just a, you know, a quarter of an inch apart from the next one, 
if you hit that first domino, what happens to all the rest of the dominoes behind it? They all fall. Well, folk, the beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists, the beliefs that we hold, whether we know it or not, they're like dominoes. If you start, if you hit one of the beliefs that we hold as a people, then all the rest of them go with it. Do you realize that? For example, let's say we take the view that atonement was finished at the cross. Okay, let's say we take that position. If we do, then Ellen White immediately is a false prophet. Why? Because she said that atonement was going on in heaven. You see? Now, if we say that atonement was finished at the cross, then nothing of significance happened in 1844. So, if nothing happened of significance in 1844, then Seventh-day Adventism has no reason for existence. You realize that? We have no reason to exist. If atonement was finished at the cross, then nothing happened in 1844. Christ did not begin his work in the most holy place. And that law that's in the most holy place, who cares? It's meaningless. It has no meaning. It has no purpose. So, folk, immediately, if you say atonement is finished at the cross, you have declared Ellen White to be a false prophet. Seventh-day Adventism has no reason to exist. It's not a historic people of prophecy. 1844 was, as Donald Gray Barnhouse said, the greatest face-saving device ever invented by man. And so we have no reason to be here today. Do you see the point? One domino falls and all the rest of them topple. So when people start discussing the, the key doctrines of Seventh-day Adventists, our ears need to perk up. They better perk up, folk, because if you don't watch it within a matter of 10 minutes or so, you could be saying, oh yeah, you're right. And you could be nodding your head saying, I don't have any reason to exist as a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay? So they're like dominoes. If one falls, all the rest of them go with it. The snowball descends. Okay, it's just what I just said. Because the teachings of Seventh-day Adventists are close, so closely intertwined, if you move one peg, they all go. If atonement was finished at the cross, 1844, Daniel 8, Christ's work in the most holy place are voided. The Ten Commandments are not important. The raising up of a people at the time of 1844 is wrong, irrelevant, and unnecessary. Ellen White's a false prophet. If atonement is declared to be complete at the cross, then Seventh-day Adventism has no reason for existence and becomes a movement of the devil. It's that simple. It becomes a movement of the devil, folks. No true Seventh-day Adventist could ever make such a claim as to say atonement was complete at the cross. No Seventh-day Adventist could say that. Well, let's see what happened at those evangelical conferences and the aftermath. Seventh-day Adventism was butchered. It was butchered. Leroy Froome, Roy Allen Anderson, W.E. Reed, another Seventh-day Adventist leader, R.R. Figure, the General Conference president at that time, they all declared to the evangelicals that truly atonement was finished at the cross. Now that's what they taught, folks. That's what they taught. From these meetings in the mid-1950s came a book called Questions on Doctrine in which they declared this very lie and they tried to use Ellen White to back it up. It's a fact of history. 
The truth about the atonement. Let's look at the atonement for just a moment this afternoon. The Bible and spirit of prophecy are very clear that Christ's death was utterly crucial in the plan of salvation. However, as great as it was, it was part, it was part of the atonement process. Folk, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it was a perfect sacrifice. It was a complete sacrifice. Nothing, nobody else could ever be sacrificed. It was a complete sacrifice, but it was part of the atonement process. It was part of that process. Christ's work as man's high priest, according to inspiration, is just as important as was his death at the cross. Now, I want you to see this concept in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. Notice this, Leviticus chapter 4, verses 27 to 31. Watch the process, folks. Watch the process. Leviticus 4, 27 through 31. It's very interesting. It says, if any one of the common people sin through ignorance while he does somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he has sinned come to his knowledge... Let's notice one point. What was it that revealed sin? What was it? It was the law of God, Wendy, that's right. The Ten Commandment law of God revealed sin. And if you do away with the law of God, you do away with sin, don't you? And if you do away with the law, you've done away with sin. And if you do away with sin, you don't need a Savior, do you? You don't need a savior. Or if his sin which he has sinned come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin which he has sinned. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. Now let me ask you a question. This sacrificial animal... Who was that revealing? Who was that pointing forward to? It was revealing Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death at the cross. In every animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, they were all pointing forward to the sacrifice of Christ. Now, at this point, when the person takes the life of the sin offering, does it say atonement was made? Does, your, does it say it right there? It says, then shall slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. Does it say atonement was made? Doesn't say that, does it? Watch how it works now. It says, and the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar burnt offering and pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. And he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now notice these words. And the priest shall make an what? Atonement, Atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. Now do you notice the process here folks? You have sacrifice. You have mediation by the priest. And with those processes done, it says, then atonement is made. Okay? So is the work of Christ in the sanctuary in heaven just as important as what Christ did at the cross? Yes. Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. Christ's sacrifice, Christ's mediation are equally important in the plan of salvation. Now notice this statement, Great Controversy, page 489. Ellen White always gets such bad marks because people say, oh, well, you can't prove what she says in the Bible. Folk, the same spirit that inspired every writer in the Bible is the same spirit that inspired Ellen White. Amen. Notice what she says here. 
the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Now that's exactly what we just read in Leviticus 4, isn't it? That's exactly what we just saw. Sacrifice, mediation are alike essential to the plan of salvation. She goes on, by his death he began that work which after his resurrection he ascended to, heaven, in, to complete in heaven. We must by faith enter within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered. Hebrews 6.20 That's from Great Controversy, page 489. You know, folk, there's a lot of people that say, oh, well, Ellen White was good for the 19th century and she's good for devotional talks, but she didn't know anything about theology. Folks, that's garbage. Now, I get into trouble sometimes when I use those words, but I don't know how else to say it. That's garbage. It's garbage. It's kind of interesting. I was out in California several months ago and mentioned that I had been at Loma Linda and I gave a talk on conspiracy is there a conspiracy or is there not a conspiracy in our world today? And right from the Bible, Revelation 17 and 18, the Spirit of God is crystal clear that there's a conspiracy. There's Babylon the Great united with the kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, the churches of the earth. You have four groups of people united together to perform an illegal act. That's a conspiracy. And when I got done and, and left the podium, several, many people from Loma Linda University walked up to me and said, we've never heard anything like that. We're in a state of shock. And I looked at them and I said, well, you're a Seventh-day Adventist, right? And they said, yes. I said, well, what are your pastors teaching you? They said, well, they're, they're not teaching us that. And I said, you know what? If they're not teaching you that, then they're teaching you garbage. And this one individual took me to task for that and they said, that is not right. You should not be saying that. Well, I wrote back to the person and I said, well, I could have called it garbage or I could have used the words that Isaiah did in Isaiah 28 when he said that the prophets and priests were laying out on the table vomit. So which do you want, vomit or garbage? <laughs> However you look at it, folk, it's the same either way. Now let's notice this. After the priests made atonement in the daily work in the sanctuary, was the sin problem all taken care of? It wasn't. It wasn't. It waited for one last day at the end of the year, the seventh month, the tenth day of the month, the day of atonement. The Day of Atonement, Leviticus 23, 27 to 29. It says, on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation to you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day. For it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Now, folk, why, why, if atonement was made in the daily services, why was it necessary for there to be a day of atonement at the end of the year? Sin was taken care of. It was transferred to the sanctuary. But why a day of atonement at the end of the year? It's for this simple reason. When we sin and we confess our sin, God is faithful and just as we read in 1 John 1, 9. Right? He takes the sin and figuratively through the blood transfers it to the sanctuary. But let me ask you, when we confess our sin, do we cease to be free agents? Do we cease to have the power of choice? No. We can choose to take that sin back, can't we? 
Say I'm an alcoholic. If I get drunk and I go to God and say, forgive me, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I became intoxicated, I, I'm ruining my health, forgive me. God forgives. The sin is transferred to the sanctuary. But I have an inclination to drink. God doesn't take that away from me. I still have a choice. And the Day of Atonement at the end of the year was to see what choices, what final choice a person had arrived at. And so on the Day of Atonement, the sin problem in the camp was taken care of. It was taken care of. And anybody that was not afflicted on the Day of Atonement, what happened to them? They were removed from the camp. They were removed. So folk, the concept of atonement goes a whole lot further than sacrifice. It's sacrifice, it's mediation, and it's taking care of the sin problem. All of those things are in atonement. Atonement means taking care of the sin problem through sacrifice, mediation, and cleansing. Every phase is a part of taking care of the sin problem. Notice Numbers 25, verse 13. This is the horrible story. When the children of Israel were at the brink of the promised land, they were right there at the Jordan. They were about to go over. Balaam comes to curse God's people. He couldn't do it. So what he did was, is he got all the Midianite women. He said, you go down into the camp. You seduce, my, you seduce God's people. And when you seduce them, then the protection of God will be removed. And they'll get plagued. And then we can destroy them. Well, in the process of this horrible apostasy among Seventh-day Adventists at the Jordan River, because they were on the brink of the promised land, one Israelite leader had the audacity to bring one of the Midianite women right into the camp, walks right by Moses and Aaron as they're weeping and praying for God to stop the plague, and the man goes right into his tent with this Midianite woman and begins to have relations with her, and one of Aaron's I think it was a grandson, son or grandson, Phineas. Phineas takes a javelin, goes right into the tent, and he takes the javelin and he pins them to the earth. He pins them to the earth. Now notice what the Bible says. It says, and he, Phineas, shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. An atonement? Did he sacrifice? No. Did he mediate? No. But what he did do was, is he took care of the sin problem in the camp. Folk, Atonement from the biblical perspective involves anything that takes care of the sin problem. Is there still a sin problem in our world today? Then atonement is still going on today. As long as there is a sin problem, there will be atonement. Notice this, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. Again, taking care of the sin problem. It says there was a famine in the days of David three years. Year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. The Lord answered, it's for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. And David the king called the Gibeonites and said to them, now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Now listen to what David said. Wherefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make 
the atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord. Was David talking about sacrifice or mediation? No. But there was a sin problem in the camp. God was plaguing his people because of Saul's treatment of the Gibeonites. So David said, I want to take care of the sin problem. What do I need to do? So atonement, folks, anything that has to do with taking care of the sin problem, you have atonement. Is the atonement happening right now? Absolutely. Is the sin problem resolved in the universe? Is the sin problem resolved in this world, in this town, in your life? Do you struggle with temptation, with anger, with the lusts of the flesh? If we can answer yes to any of these questions, then atonement is still taking place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Diverting the course. The assault on the idea of atonement challenged the very rationale for Seventh-day Adventism. Without it, Adventism has no reason to exist. Walter Martin went for the jugular vein. Folk, if you attack the jugular vein, the person's dead. Walter Martin was no dummy. He was brilliant. So he went after Adventism's jugular vein. Do we or do we not believe that atonement is finished at the cross? If, Froome, if Leroy Froome and Roy Allen Anderson and R.R. Figure said, no, we do not believe that it was finished at the cross, then Walter Martin would have wrote his book and we would have been labeled a cult. But... If they said, yes, we believe that atonement is finished at the cross, then, folk, we have no reason to exist as a people. So that's the question that Leroy Froome and Roy Allen Anderson had to ask. And they chose to embrace the destruction of Seventh-day Adventism. Since Ellen White wrote of an ongoing atonement since 1844, her prophetic gift immediately came under attack and the dominoes started to fall. Folk, this happened in the mid-1950s. The famous evangelical conferences of the 1950s. You know, I get letters from all over the world from Seventh-day Adventists who have read books that I've sent out to them and they said, they write back and they say, we don't, we don't get to read the books of Ellen White anymore because they're too expensive for any Seventh-day Adventist over here to afford. Or they say, we were shocked to read that the Antichrist is, is the Catholic Church. That amazed us. We didn't have any idea that was true. Or others will say, we, we've been taught all our lives that we're going to keep right on sinning and be disobedient to God till Jesus comes. And we sit back and we say, why didn't those Seventh-day Adventists know better? Because, folk, for the last, for the last 50 to 60 years, for the most part, we have been taught as a people False doctrine. False doctrine. For nearly the last three score years. And it all happened, started back here at those evangelical conferences. The next thing that came under attack was the nature of Christ. Walter Martin and Donald Gray Barnhouse said Christ took a perfect nature like Adam before the fall. If you Adventists say that he took a sinful nature, then you're a cult. And so Leroy Froome, Roy Allen Anderson, Figur, the other leaders in Seventh-day Adventism, this is what they wrote in Questions on Doctrine, page 383. It says this, Although born in the flesh, Christ was nevertheless God and was exempt from 
the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. Folk, to be exempt means you have no part of. You have no part of it. As a ministry in Florida, I have a letter and I have a little card when I go in to buy supplies at Walmart. I give them that card and they have a sheet that I have that says I am exempt from paying taxes toward things that I use in ministry. What that simply means is I don't pay taxes. Okay? Because I am a ministry. Well, folk, to be exempt from means you have no part in it. Leroy Froome and Roy Allen Anderson said Christ had no part, was completely aloof from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. Now, folk, prior to this statement in Questions on Doctrine, for over a hundred years, Seventh-day Adventists always taught that Christ took on a sinful nature like Adam after he fell. And why did they take that position? Because that's what the Bible teaches. Amen. Notice Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 to 18. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily, for truly, he, Christ, took not on him the nature of angels. Christ did not have the nature of an angel when he came to this world. Well, what kind of a nature did he have then? It says he had the nature, he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now, what kind of a nature did the children of Abraham possess? What kind? It was a fallen nature. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure or aid them that are tempted. Romans 8, 3 and 4, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, no human being ever in sinful flesh had ever perfectly obeyed the law of God. It says God sending his own own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. So Christ took upon himself our sinful flesh, took no advantage. Why did he do that? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled where? In heaven? At the cross? No, in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8, 3 and 4. He overcame, so we can. Christ came in our sinful flesh, came under the same temptations that we experience, but never once yielded to sin. The Bible's so clear. 1 Peter chapter 2, 2 Corinthians 5, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He overcame in our flesh in order that he can enable us to overcome in our flesh. 1 Peter 2, okay, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Why? That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. 
The dominoes are collapsing, folks. Atonement, gone. Nature of Christ, gone. The spirit of prophecy, gone. 1844, gone. 1958, Sabbath school lesson. The Sabbath school lessons of 1958, the study was over the book of Revelation. I believe it was the second quarter. The portion on Revelation 13, which of course looks at our understanding of the role of the papacy and the United States of America in end time Bible prophecy in setting up a Sunday law. In the Sabbath school lesson, when it came to Revelation 13, it was completely removed from the lesson quarterly. Right after the book Questions on Doctrine came out. From this time, back there in the 1950s, Seventh-day Adventists have become tongue-tied as far as who the beasts are in Revelation chapter 13. Tongue-tied, folks. You say, are you saying everybody? No, I didn't say everybody. I said, generally speaking, we have become tongue-tied as a people. A lady sent me a book, it's this thick. It was put out by a Seventh-day Adventist theologian at Andrews University. He has a Eastern European name. I think it's like Stepanek or something like that. It's a look at the entire book of Revelation. When it gets to Revelation 13, it's amazing how a very articulate and very scholarly man can become utterly and completely tongue-tied. He could not say who the first beast of Revelation 13 is. He could not do it. And folk, for some reason as a people, we, we have a hard time saying it anymore. We have a hard time. You know, one of the great things that, come against, that comes against me for writing the books that I have is Seventh-day Adventists will quote from councils to writers and editors where Ellen White says we should not make hard thrusts against the Catholics. Well, folk, you know, we have used that. I've heard that statement so many times. Folk, in reality, what really comes out is we don't want to say who the Antichrist is anymore because it's not politically correct. That's the bottom line. You say, but Bill, you're, you do make some hard thrusts. Well, let me ask you a question. If I were to call somebody a whore, a prostitute, a, a cold-blooded killer, are those hard thrusts? Would you say those are hard thrusts? Well, you know what? If we interpret that statement in councils on writer to, writers and editors to my books and say I'm making hard thrusts, well, the place where I got that the papacy is a whore, a prostitute, and a cold-blooded killer, that's found in Revelation chapter 17. Are we going to say that Revelation 17 has hard thrusts also? How about in um, Revelation 13, it talks about a beast, and a beast is, a, is an animal, right? A cold-blooded, doesn't think, animal. Just does whatever it wants to do whenever it wants to do it, right? That's what an animal does. Well, Revelation 13 talks about an animal that gets its power from hell. It's demonic, okay? It's a cold-blooded killer. It's a commandment breaker. Are those hard thrusts? Be honest, are those hard thrusts? Yeah. They are, aren't they? That's found in Revelation chapter 13. Are we now going to say that the book of Revelation contains hard thrusts, therefore we're not going to talk about it anymore? Come on, folks. So I have a point. If you go to, it is written, and we use the hard thrust approach, I think we would do more damage that way, like in it is written seminars than the way they're conducted now. That's my own personal opinion. Uh, I dated a Catholic boy um, years and years ago, and when I told him what the mark
mark of the beast was all about and everything. I totally insulted him, and it was the truth and all of that, and uh, I didn't hear the end of that. That just shut the door. I ended up years later marrying an ex-Catholic, but he didn't get he didn't get the door slammed in his face with a hard thrust. He said if it had hit him that way, he would have just walked right out the door. That happened to his parents. Cindy, let me say this. When you are sitting down with an individual, that's one thing. If you're in one-on-one -on -one contact with somebody and you're discussing biblical issues, that's one thing. There are ways to deal with issues where you don't have to come out and just smack them, okay? However, Cindy, if we're having a Revelation seminar, okay, and we're talking in Revelation chapter 13, and we say, okay, here we have a beast, and a beast in Bible prophecy represents a world power, okay? And this, this world power rises up out of the sea, which represents the old world of the Mediterranean, where nations have always been in existence. And this world power that rose up in the Mediterranean world, it commits blasphemy. And blasphemy in the Bible is claiming to be God on earth, claiming the titles of God, and claiming to forgive sins. Okay? And then you keep going down, Cindy. You don't have to mention who it is. You just go down through all the characteristics. Now, Cindy, as you're going through the characteristics, you say, well, what power is this that rose up in the Mediterranean world that claims it's God on earth, claims it can forgive sins, persecutes God's people, changes the Ten Commandments? You see, so you give Cindy the characteristics, and then, Cindy, when you get done, you say, who, who does this represent? And Cindy, most likely you will get a many people in the congregation who will say, this represents Roman Catholicism. Right. You see? Well, that's exactly right, Cindy. But in what we're doing here today, I'm not in an evangelistic series. I'm just making a point. So different time, different group, different approach. Okay, I would not be making the comments the way I'm making them today if I were in a group that had apostate Protestants and Roman Catholics. I would not. I would lay down all the groundwork so that they could give an answer. Okay, okay? so it's a different, different time, different place, different method. But the message, the message doesn't change. This message doesn't change. But among Seventh-day Adventists, the message has changed. And it all had its roots in the mid-1950s. Notice this. This is the editor of the Adventist Review, William Johnson, 1994-1995. This was an insert in the Review and Herald. It was called Saints' Victory in the End Time. This is what was written. He said, to interpret the sea monster... That's the first beast of Revelation 13. Of Revelation 13, as the papacy seems somewhat out of keeping with the spirit of the times. In an age when Christianity in general faces the onslaughts of secularism and when among Christians ecumenism has become popular, the interpretation, now what interpretation is he talking about? The interpretation that the papacy is the first beast of Revelation 13. He says, the interpretation smacks of narrowness and bigotry. Now that's an altering of a message. Not of method, not of time and place or method. We're changing what we believe here, folks. This is a change. I went back and I looked up every reference in the spirit of prophecy to the first beast of Revelation 13. And the spirit of prophecy over 90 times states that the first beast represents Rome. So according to this editor of the Seventh-day Adventist Review, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is narrow-minded 
and a bigot. Now, folk, this, this is the fruitage of what began back in the 1950s. This is apostasy from what we believe as a people. Here's another statement. This is taken from a former president of the General Conference. At the time he made the statement, he was a vice president of the General Conference. The man's name was Neil Wilson. He made this statement in a court case in the mid-1970s between Mary Kay Silver and the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He made this statement. Although it's true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took a distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint, that attitude on the church's part was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of this century and the latter part of the last, and which has now been consigned to the historical trash heap so far as the Seventh-day Adventist Church is concerned. Now, folk, that's, that's apostasy. That's heresy. That's abomination. And as Isaiah 28 says, that's vomit. This is vomit right here. Because Neil Wilson is saying, what we used to believe about the papacy being the Antichrist, well, we believed that because everybody else did back in the 1800s. But we don't believe it anymore. George Vandeman. George Vandeman. His book, The Rise and Fall of the Antichrist, pages 54 and 55. He says this, these were dark ages for the church. How could Christians be so intolerant of their brothers and sisters in Christ? Jesus had predicted that those who killed his followers would sincerely think they were serving God. It's not for us to question our medieval ancestors. He's talking about the Catholic Church. Goes on, he says, nor must we overlook the good done by the church. Throughout the world, monasteries provided care for orphans, widows, and the sick. And all of us owe appreciation to the church of the Middle Ages for preserving the scriptures. Folk, that's an out and out lie. That's a denial of history. It's a denial and a rejection of the book Great Controversy. And all this man is trying to do in this book is to kowtow and bow down and be accepted by by Rome. You're saying Vandeman said that? Cindy, you go back to the book The Rise and Fall of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. I did. When I picked up the book, I said, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure that in this book, George Vandeman is going to point out, after going through all the characteristics, exactly who the Antichrist is. I'm sure he'll do that. So I opened the book to the table of contents and I looked down the rise and fall of the Antichrist. There was a chapter right there and I said, I'm sure in this book he's going to go right through very kindly, very logically, but show clearly who the Antichrist is. This is what I read. So what I'm supposed to believe then is that number one, the Catholic Church is Christian, which it is not. Number two, that the Catholic Church did many good things through the Dark Ages, especially preserving the Bible for us. Now, folks, that, that's, that's a lie. That's a lie. Oh, it should, yes, Dr. Lee, yes, I'll need to fix that. The rise and fall of the Antichrist. Thank you. I'll have to change that. Dumb dogs that will not bark. This was taken from the Review and Herald, September 9, 23 and 30, 1993. Folk, that's 16 years ago? 
This has been going on and on and on, and it gets worse and worse, folks. This is what an associate editor of the Adventist Review said at that time. John Paul was in Denver. He said, I was surprised and delighted to learn that the Bible is the sole textbook during the Pope's visit and the World Youth Day activities. What a wonderful opportunity for so many young people to hear the gospel message straight from God's Word. You know what Myron Widmer was saying? He was saying John Paul was using the Bible and John Paul was preaching the gospel to the young people in Denver. Now, folks, I want to ask you a question. The gospel, okay, we noticed it this morning in Sabbath school, the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14. Which part of the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14 was John Paul preaching to the people in Denver? Was it the part that says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come? Or was he telling them to worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters? Was he telling them that Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication? Well, he must have then be preaching the third one that says, if any man worship the beast in his image. <laughs> Folk, you know, we sit here and chuckle. Folk, this, this is seducing. This is seducing the people of God. This is putting vomit on the tables for Seventh-day Adventist people to be fed by. This is to help Seventh-day Adventists to get ready for the kingdom of God. And people at Seventh-day Adventists are throwing millions and millions of dollars to support this. Folk, if we don't laugh, as Jeremiah said, my eyes are full of tears. They're running like rivers of water. This is insanity. This is insanity. This is destroying, destroying people, destroying Seventh-day Adventists. A dear lady in Portland, she's sitting in this room. Back in 2004, I believe, it was a few years ago, we were having some meetings. She stood up in the meeting and she told a story. She said she had a friend that lived in Washington, D.C. And one day her friend invited a friend of hers who was a Roman Catholic to go to lunch with her in the cafeteria of the sanitarium in Washington, D.C. So this Seventh-day Adventist woman takes her Catholic friend, they go into this cafeteria, they get their food, they sit down to eat their lunch, and all of a sudden the Catholic woman says, what are they doing here? And the Seventh-day Adventist woman looks at her Catholic friend and says, what do you mean? Who, who's doing here? What, who are you talking about? And the Catholic woman pointed at two men and she said, What are those two men doing here? The Seventh-day Adventist woman looked and noticed two men standing over there and she said, Those two men are Seventh-day Adventist ministers. The Catholic woman looked at her Adventist friend and said, those are not Seventh-day Adventist ministers. Those are Roman Catholic priests. And the two men, the two men that the Catholic woman was pointing at when she said that, it was Leroy Froome and Roy Allen Anderson. Now, folk, I'll let you decide. I'll let you decide. One thing is absolutely, beyond a shadow of doubt, crystal clear. Those two men were instrumental in bringing such devastation, such heartbreak, such tragedy into the ranks of Seventh-day Adventists by what they did. Folk, we have work to do.
We have work to do. Many of God's people have been derailed. Many have thrown away the Advent message, never to, never to share it again. Many take their, Ellen, their books by Ellen White and either cast them into the fire, throw them into a garbage can, some even do it on a pulpit. But folk, we still have work to do. God has still called us to do a work for this hour. And it doesn't matter what anybody else has done. We, individually, collectively, we have a responsibility. We can sit back and say, oh, shame on them. Well, yeah, shame on them. But if we sit on our lees and do nothing, then shame on us. Shame on us. I will close with this passage, Revelation 3, verses 9 through 11. To the church at Philadelphia, historically from 1798 to 1844, but I believe the experience hits towards us as well today. It says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, those who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, but are not, and do lie, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. And then Christ said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Folk, if it was true in John's day, how much more true is it today? Christ indeed is coming quickly. Let's hold on fast to the messages that he has given to us. Let's hold on fast to his hand day by day so we can see him give us victory in our lives because he's coming soon. Let's kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your words today. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the spirit of prophecy. Forgive us, Father, for the apostasy. Forgive us for apostasy that we allow in our own lives. Forgive us for, for choosing to go our way instead of your way. Forgive us for sitting still when we should say something. Forgive us for not standing up and being counted as one of your children as the people of Levi did long ago at Sinai. Father, help us to be bold. Help us to stand in defense of what is true and right. Help us to fight your battles and help us to allow you to fight our battles in our lives day by day. Father, I just pray that you'd strengthen each one of us to stand up, to be a Protestant in this time when champions